Hope you're having a good day. Today I'll be discussing the Kerr effect and how you can use it to find timing between two different ultra-fast laser pulses. So when you have an ultra-fast laser, you have two pulses. One of them's the probe, one of them's the pump. Let's call this the pump. This is the probe. And the electric field only varies on the order of femtoseconds to picoseconds. The Kerr effect is essentially says that the index of refraction depends on the intensity of light. And you can write it as the linear index of refraction, a part that does not depend on the intensity, and a part that does depend on the intensity, the nonlinear index of refraction, N2. N2 is equal to some constant, doesn't matter for these purposes, times chi 3, where chi 3 is the third order nonlinear susceptibility. So the susceptibility can be written as a series, chi 1 plus chi 2 plus chi 3 and higher order terms. The same thing can be done with the polarization. And the polarization is essentially chi times the electric field and uh, your higher order p's. So let's take p2 for example. p2 is going to equal chi 2 times uh, the electric field squared. Okay, but that's not that important. I just wanted to remind you what chi was if you forgot. It's essentially how easy it is it to induce an electric field in your material. And I like to think of the different chi's as corresponding to different wave mixing processes. So chi 1 is 2 wave mixing, chi 2 is 3 wave mixing, chi 3 is 3 wave mixing. I'm very interested in chi 3 because I do Raman spectroscopy, which is a 4 wave mixing process. And chi 3 also shows up in the Kerr effect from this, oh sorry I wrote, no that's, yeah N2, N2 that's a 2, sub 2 equals some constant times chi 3. And chi 3 is very small usually, because else we would have seen nonlinear optical phenomena before lasers were invented, but they were only seen when lasers were invented because lasers concentrate light down into a small space. And with the advent of ultra-fast lasers, we also compressed the light intensity down to a small time. So now that we have a short space and a short time duration and the intensity is the power is the power per area per time well then no it's the energy per area per time so the time part's in the power. But when we had continuous wave lasers, the area got very small. So laser fields got, or we had access to more intense light sources. And with the advent of ultra-fast lasers, the power part got bigger. So we have really, really large intense laser, intense light fields now. So now we can really see the Kerr effect and study it. Anyways, I'm not sure how the Kerr guy found the effect, but uh, regardless, let's go through this. So how do you use this to find timing? Okay, so what the Kerr effect is going to do to your material is it's going to induce a birefringence. Birefringence means you have a different index of refraction in different directions. 
So you can think of the index of refraction as a perpendicular part or a vertical part and a horizontal part. A horizontal part and a vertical part. Okay. And if this is our material, and that's what it looks like before we pass light through it, if we pass light through it, then it might look like something else. And before it might have just had an index or a fraction n with n perp. No, wait, so, but the perp is with that symbol. The horizontal and vertical components were equal. Okay? Initially. So isotropic index or a fraction. But if you pass a laser pump through, well then, uh, you're actually going to have a horizontal part and a vertical part where n horizontal is not equal to the n vertical. So, utilizing this fact, uh, you can change the polarization of your light. So, let's say we bring in our pump pulse first. And let's say our pump pulse has a vertical polarization and when it's going through our material the electric field points upwards. So let's take as our sample water. Also I'll just draw a few water molecules and they're ran our sample's randomly oriented. So there's no net electric field throughout our sample. It's random. Okay the pulse is going to pass through. So the pump passes through. And now our sample is going to look different. The hydrogens, they're positively charged. They're going to be attracted towards the... Okay, it's, so it's like you have positive charge here and a negative charge there. So the hydrogens are going to be attracted towards the tip of that arrow. So after the pulse passes through, your sample is going to look something like this. Okay, and the pulse is over here now. So now, if you take your probe pulse, and let's say our probe pulse has a diagonal polarization of 45 degrees. Our sample still looks like this. So whereas with the pump pulse, the molecules were randomly oriented and the sample didn't have a net electric field, now, at least when the probe approaches the pump, in time, now the molecules are going to be oriented like this and there is going to be a net electric field in the sample. So you can decompose the components of the this field here into a vertical part plus a horizontal part. And I like to think of, well so there's an electric field here and the electric field from the sample basically um, looks like that. So the electric field is going to sort of oppose the incoming probe's electric field in the vertical direction because of the birefringence. So it's going to squish this arrow down. So after the probe passes through, probe passes through the sample, it's going to look like this. It's going to have a small vertical arrow. Might even switch the direction of the vertical arrow. But the horizontal arrow is going to be left untouched. The horizontal component. Um, so this, this, this vector here has the same magnitude as this vector, whereas this vector is much smaller than this 
magnitude of this vector here. So um, our new polarization, or the total vector, is going to look something like that, where this angle here is 45 degrees minus some angle, which depends on how intense the pump was, um, how closely overlapped the pulses are in time, so forth. So, not the polarization changed. And if we detect this change in polarization, when the polarization's most changed, you know the pulses are most overlapped. So if we take a polarizer, or not a polarizer, but uh, an analyzer, and it only analyzes light that comes in at this angle, and on the other side of the analyzer, you got a detector, uh, let's say a photodiode. So it it's going to read out um, a voltage, and you're going to be plotting different points as you change the timing between the pulses. Okay, so at first you're going to have a constant voltage, and then as the pulses get close together, more and more light's going to get through this analyzer because it's polarized at the correct direction, and you're going to detect more and more signal, and as the probe passes the pump in time, the signal is going to go back down. And you know you have timing at this maximum here. So this time, T0 is going to correspond to some number on your delay stage, and you know at that position of the delay stage, you have maximum overlap in time of your pulses. So, that's how you use the Kerr effect to find timing overlap between two ultrafast pulses. Thanks for watching and have a great day.